Well, my title this morning is Jesus Loves Mother-in-Laws and Mothers, and You Should Too. And I didn't just make it up, it's scriptural. It is scriptural. The Bible tells us that Jesus loves mother-in-laws and mothers, and that we should too. And if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to put it up there if you haven't. I'd like to... uh, No, I don't quite want to go there actually. Yep. We will get there. But I think um, loving our mothers and mother-in-laws, if we're going to be like Jesus, let's love our mothers and mother-in-laws. Wherever, whenever, be like Jesus. Have you noticed that the Gospels don't tell us a whole lot of stuff? They do not tell us what Jesus' favourite colour is. Of course, they don't need to. We know it's green. It would just be a waste of ink. But they don't tell us. They don't tell us what his favourite food is. Probably steak. Sorry if you're a vegan. But it was actually might have been fish. But anyway, it doesn't tell us it, does it? It doesn't tell us what his favourite sport was. Did he even like sport? He probably did. Would have been a motor racing fan for sure. Uh, It doesn't tell us where he went for holidays. And it doesn't tell us what his political um, preferences were. It doesn't tell us who was his favourite, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. It doesn't tell us that. But what it does tell us, and what the Gospels do tell us very, very clearly, is that Jesus was about the purpose of his Father. And the purpose of his Father is people. People. Jesus loves people. That's what he's all about. And if we want to wherever, whenever, be like Jesus, loving people has to be right up here in our priority list, right up there, because Jesus did. I find one of the great ironies of living in today's age is that we have more devices than we've ever had to help us connect with people. How many of you, raise your hand, if in your house or on your person, you have more than one device to help you connect with people? A lot of you are putting your hands up. The rest of you are lying because I just don't believe you. <laughs> if you've got a phone and you've got a computer, there's two ways. If you've got two phones, there's two ways. There are so many devices, so many ways to connect with people these days, yet our ability in the art of connection has almost been lost, hasn't it? Compared to what it used to be. Can I ask you this? When is the last time that you had a guest over for a meal at home? When is the last time that you had a stranger, as in someone you've just met, don't know, over to your house for a meal? It's sort of something that doesn't happen so often now. When's the last time you were invited to someone's house for a meal? See, the the art of connection, the art of hospitality, the art of community has been lost. And that's one of the reasons we've got to be so, so intentional in the life of the church to keep it alive is because Jesus, wherever, whenever, be like Jesus, Jesus is all about people and connecting with people and loving on people. Jesus is the master of connection. He can relate with anyone, anywhere, any time, which is great news. And that's part of the good news of the gospel is that he gets you. He understands you. He understands where you're at. He understands what you're about. He understands what you're going through. He just, he gets you and he wants to be part of it. He wants to be part of your life, your journey. I heard a great quote and I think I will quote this many times in years to come because I absolutely love it. Jesus asks us to follow him fully, not flawlessly. I love that. Jesus asks us to follow him fully, but not flawlessly. And part of following him fully is connecting with people, is doing life together with people, is community, is as he did. Also, Jesus was and is the absolute master of house calls. He was the master of house calls. And we read that in the scripture. After leaving 
It's Luke 4, from 38. After leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home, where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. Standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. As the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Many were possessed by demons, and demons came out at his command, shouting, You are the Son of God. But because they knew he was the Messiah, he rebuked them and refused to let them speak. Interesting, we hear of Jesus casting out demons a lot. Demon literally means demonic power. That's what the word means. If you understand the scriptures in full, you understand, you will know that a third of the angels of heaven fell when the devil fell. And they are what we call demons. They are angels, angelic beings that work against the cause of Christ against the cause of Christ, against the cause of God. In the Bible, um, they don't win at all. But the Bible clearly tells us that our battle for righteousness, our battle for the extension of the kingdom of God is against powers and principalities. It's not against people. Even if that person sitting next to you this morning really ticks you off. It's not against them. It's not against people. It's against powers and principalities in the unseen world, demonic forces, these angels. Jesus continues to preach in Galilee. Oh, that's the title. That shouldn't be there. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. This morning I have five points that I want to share with you. One of the things I love about this passage of Scripture is that it actually embraces all of our values, the whole five of them. Five points I want to share with you this morning are the family benefit, blessing is blessed, authority modelled, alone, not isolated, and encounters response. And if you look there, you can see where our values tie up very beautifully. Family benefit, belonging, blessing uh, is blessed. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. I might need help going backwards. Oh, I've really mucked it up. Hang on. what happens when you try to be flash, make it do it itself. Ah, there we go. The family benefit, belonging, blessed, big-hearted, purpose and kingdom focused on authority, modelled, alone, not isolated, again, belonging, and encounters response is actually all of the above. So this passage of Scripture is really, really great because it covers all the bases as far as our values go. It's wonderful. The first one, the family benefit. Have you noticed that where the leaders, leader, leaders of the household are passionate for Jesus and they make space for the things of God, the whole household benefits. The whole household. They made room for Jesus to come in. I don't even know if they knew Jesus was coming. But, you know, Simon rocks up. He's got Jesus in tow with him. And when they're there, they discover that mum-in-law is unwell, and they beg for the miracle, and Jesus goes, yeah, no problem, and heals her. The whole household benefited from Jesus' house call. And as leaders of your home, your whole family will benefit when you pursue God. Your whole family will benefit when you pursue the presence of God in your house. At all times. In this case, we see healing, the environments change, relationships strengthened, culture of the home is, re- is established, and peace is brought into that home simply because they embraced the presence 
of Jesus. Can I encourage you, ask you, as a disciple of Christ and as a leader in your home, to intentionally ensure the presence of God is in your house. Intentionally ensure that Jesus is involved in the conversation around your tables, in your lounge room. Intentionally create a space where God can be present. Because the benefits will go far, far wider than you can imagine. I mean, not only did the benefits bless the household, they blessed the whole community. Let's go to number two. Blessing is blessed. Blessed of God or blessed literally means cause to prosper. That's what the word means. Cause to prosper or favoured by God. So for those who are blessed by God, they've been caused to prosper. They've been favoured by God. God. God loves every person equally, but I do believe he has favorites. I won't go into that now. That just wrecks some of your theology. But anyway, the home that welcomes Jesus is a blessed home. It is a blessed home. It becomes a place of blessing. It becomes a place of healing. As I said, not only for that home, but for the whole community that is connected to that home. Jesus prayed for the mum-in-law. She was healed. She served a meal. They probably had a break for a little bit. And then all the community started bringing their sick, their afflicted, into the house. And as he laid hands on them, they were all healed. The blessing on that home, the environment in that home, affected the whole community. You have the same power with your home. You have the same power within your home to create an environment which is God-honoring, which he then blesses, and it will affect everybody that is attached to your community. I pray that when people come into our home, they sense the peace of God. I pray that when people come into our home, they, they become part of engaging with God conversation and God-honoring conversation. I've had many people over the years come into our home and say, your home just feels different. We like it. We don't know what it is. It feels different. I know what it is. It's the presence of God. God is present in our home, and I pray He's present in your home too. You have the right to create that environment. The blessing of God is not about containment. That's really the point here. It's not about containment. It's about going out. It's not just for us. The blessing of God's not just for me. Genesis 2.12 actually says that we're blessed to be a blessing. Promise to Abraham. We're blessed to be a blessing. The, 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 it, it's not just to be contained. I'm, like to, I'm to be a filter, a conduit for the blessings of God. So are you. For the blessings of God. Through. Through. If I can create an environment, that is good. I had one of our neighbours ring us up recently with some bad news for me. Sheridan, he said, my cows got through the fence and they've broken your tree. I said to Jan, it's only a tree, I don't care. There's only one tree on the whole property. I don't want broken. Guess which one it broke. Yes, at the roots too. Anyway, I texted him back and I said, oh, stuff happens, don't worry about it. And uh, he comes back to me and he says, look, I'll replace it for you. I said, no, don't worry about replacing it. It's just a tree. I sorted out, you know. That was before I knew it was my favourite tree. <laughs> anyway, I said, don't worry about it. We'll, so we'll sort it out. He comes back to me and he goes, you are the most easygoing, relaxed neighbour I've ever had. And I thought, that's awesome. I replied to him and I said, just remember where much, gra where, where much grace is given, it will be expected back at some point. Not if, it's just when. It's just when. And um, he's a lovely guy. But I thought, you know, that's, that's something of being able to simply release the atmosphere of blessing that's in our home the atmosphere of faith that's in our home and it affects because it's not to be contained. Very, very easy. I had to buy a new tree. I'm going to have to wait another. It was the first year of fruiting. First year of fruiting. Anyway, that's all right. 
I went to my sister and she gave me some instead. Number three, authority modelled. Authority modelled. I love this. In John 14, Jesus says to us, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I've done. So let's have a look what Jesus did. He's modelling authority in the Scripture and he's modelling it beautifully. You know, he comes in, he stands at her bedside, he rebukes the fever and it left her. She got up at once. Then many people are brought in, both sick, no matter what their disease is, the touch of his hand healed every one of them. There were many demon possessed and it was, they were cast out of all of them and he refused to let them speak. What does authority look like? I think authority looks like five C's. It looks like confidence. There's a big difference between, between confidence and arrogance. Often confidence looks like arrogance to insecure people. But there's a big difference. My confidence is not in myself. My confidence is in God. But if that means I can step out confidently in God, I will. But if you don't understand my confidence is in God, you could very easily say, wow, he's arrogant. There's a big difference. Big difference. Secondly, conviction. Well, confidence. He shows his confidence, doesn't he? Because he comes in. I no doubt he was sitting down, probably reclining or whatever. And they, they beg him to heal the mother-in-law. So the Bible tells us that he stands. And he stands over here. That is a posture of confidence, isn't it? He didn't kind of like, oh yeah, whatever. He just, he stands. So I can just imagine him standing very, very relaxed, but very confident. Confident. He knew who he was. Authority is also having the conviction to do and say what needs to be done and said. He simply rebukes the sickness, and it leaves. He didn't ask it to leave. He didn't suggest it leave. He rebuked it and told it to leave. He, had, he was certain. He didn't then stand there, and I confess I do this sometimes. I hope this is going to work now. <laughs> I've prayed. I really hope it's going to leave. No, no, he was absolutely certain. He rebuked it, and it was gone. Done. Authority. He was consistent. It was courageous too. Consistent. He then laid hands on everyone who came and got exactly the same result. It says everyone who he laid his hand on was healed. Amazing. And then finally, he was calm. Demonic spirits are coming out and trying to say things. He just says, Shh, cut it out. No speaking. Absolutely calm. I think there are five words that describe authority quite well. Confident, conviction, certain, consistent, and calm. Let's move on to number four. Alone, not isolated. Now, I'm not good at this. Sometimes I get trapped in my diary. And uh, this, is, this is one of my big work-on areas of life. In that, you know, sometimes you can be driven. And you just cannot get away. Jesus modelled and knew what it was to get away to refresh. He knew how vital it was to withdraw, withdraw to withcharge, to recharge, sorry. Withdraw to recharge. He knew that after time with people ministering, time that was demanding on him, he just had to get aside for a time just to recharge his battery. It wasn't a long time, but it was for a time. Alone in an isolated place for a time is vastly different from living an isolated life. Did you get that? Because that's quite important. Alone in an isolated place for a period of time is vastly different from living an isolated life. We are designed for community. It's the way we've been created. We're not designed just to off out of here. We're actually designed to do life with people. But the truth is we do need to learn to withdraw from people to recharge our batteries. If you're an introvert, you need to do that more often. It's just how you work. It's how I work. I need to get some space on my own where I've just got no demands around me. I can focus on my relationship with Jesus allow myself to be recharged. And that way, we can minister, we can live out of overflow. Now, we, we have tank water at home. 
And if there's no rain for a long time, when that water gets really, really low, it's going to get dirty. Because all the impurities in the water sink to the bottom. And yours and my life is the same. If we're not full, if we don't keep ourselves charged, refreshed in God, and allow the levels to go too low, we start to, when the tap's turned on, it's the dirty water that starts to come out rather than the fresh water that's been poured in. It's just the way we work. We need to stay full. It's a, it, it's a, a very, very important leadership lesson. If you're a leader in any environment, you've got to stay full. Because if you get too low, it's the sludge that starts to come out. You start to react poorly. You start to say things that you wish you hadn't said. You know, it's like toothpaste, isn't it? You know, the words are out, you can't get them back in. It, it, you start, all those sorts of things happen. But if you're full, if your capacity if, is full, it's so much better. I don't know why I'm saying this. I'm saying it for someone because I wasn't going here. But we need to learn to live full. Because for many of us, it takes 90% of our energy, 90% of our capacity to survive well. So if we're running at 80 full, we're in serious trouble. We actually need to be at 100 because then it gives us 10% to come and go on. It's called overflow. And unless we've got overflow, we're always, always struggling. Okay, the last one, encounters, response. Encounters, response. And this is where I want to land. This is really the, the point I want, to, I want us to engage with, really engage with today. According to the passage, oh, it's on here, looking at the wrong screen. Standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever and it left her, this is Simon's mother-in-law, and she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. This passage says to me that the response, the natural response to encountering Jesus is service. It's a natural response to encountering Jesus is service. I encounter Jesus, well, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. I want to serve you. What can I do for you? How can I best Give my life to you, for you, for your purposes. It's a natural response, which makes me quite concerned. Because churches today, all over the Western world particularly, are full of people who want to be served and need to be served, rather than serve. Actually carrying a, a, um, a culture and a spirit of service is becoming the minority not the majority. Most of it's what's in this for me. It's this whole uh, culture of consumerism. What's in this for me? I mean, it's even hard, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone because you know, they're back at me. But it's hard sometimes to get people to do things in the life of the church. And this isn't even service. This is your home. This is no different. I'm going to make lunch for Jan today. And why can I do that? I can do that because it's Mother's Day and I want to make lunch for her and it's my house and I'm just serving my house. It's, it's not work. It's just the way it is. And that's like in the environment here. You know, we're family. This is your house. Get involved. Make it happen. There's certain things that need to be done. But in today's world, there's this consumerist mentality that just kind of sucks one way, one direction only. They, they say that, that Gen Z which is, um, I think they're saying if you're roughly 18 to 35, 30 plus, you're in Gen Z. Um, I didn't realise, you, you were the largest generation to ever live at one time on the planet. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's congratulations or not. not. But, but we're teaching a whole generation that it's just about them, which is not good. Not good at all. But here's the deal. If the natural response to an encounter with Jesus is service, does the fact that more than ever we've got generations that want to be served indicate that we have a lack of encounter with Jesus? That's my question. And if that's the case, whose fault is it? 
I think we should play the finger pointing game now. Is it Dan's fault? Is it Nairi's fault? Is it Ray's fault? Maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's all of our fault. I think that's the right answer, actually. I think maybe it's all of our fault. Our expectation for encounter needs to be stirred. Get in the presence of God. We encounter His character, His nature, His presence. Oh, I didn't feel anything. So what? I can't remember what I had for dinner last Wednesday night, but it was good. It kept me alive. It kept me going. And there's this request. I think Jesus has done what He was going to do, pretty much. And now He's saying, come on. I'm here, I'm available, I am amongst you, push in to the place of encounter. Are you, are you grateful? Have you actually encountered me? Do you want to encounter my presence? Do you want to encounter my love? Do you want to have more than just a religious ethic and live in a relationship? Because out of that will flow everything that needs to flow. And part of that, I believe, is service. Lord, my life is no longer my own, it's yours. You do with it as you please, because it's yours. Knowing by faith that His plans and purposes for my life are better than anything I could dream up on my own. Knowing by faith that if I live according to His plans and purposes, I will live my best life. I think maybe it's everybody's fault. Lack of encounter, I think. I look in that, the, the scripture there and please heal her. And everyone begged. Please heal. It's like he's in the room, but nothing was going to happen until they asked. And they didn't just ask, they begged. Please, Jesus. Touch her. Do something with her. She encountered the healing power of God, which cracked open the atmosphere. She jumps up. She serves them, prepares a meal for them, refreshes them. Then the whole community comes in that needs the encounter with Jesus. And every single one of them, it says, were healed or set free. Every single one encountered because they asked and they begged. Encounter is intentional. It is intentional. I mean, sometimes God will surprise you. I can remember driving my car once, just praying. I suppose that was intentional. I was praying, I was worshipping. And just the presence of God filled my car so incredibly, I thought I was going to crash. I really did. Just pull over quickly. It was amazing. But I guess just thinking about it now, it was intentional. I was worshipping, I was praying. Encounter is intentional. Jesus has set the playing field. He's saying, come on, push in a bit. Put yourself in environments of encounter. That, that's why we did a church conference a couple of months ago. And you know why? Push. Come on, come. It's going to be awesome. It'll be an environment of encounter. And I just know that a lot of you don't get it. I've got the speaker. Oh, I don't know who that speaker is. Is he going to be any good? Afterwards, flip, he was fantastic. Of course he was. We invited him. But that's not what it's about. It's about an environment of encounter that you can intentionally put yourself in where we haven't got the restraints that we have on a Sunday morning. You just put yourself in there and allow the presence of God in your world. Encounter is a result of being hungry. I'm convinced that I could go from this day for all of my days and never encounter the presence of God in an impacting way if I'm not hungry. If I'm not saying, Lord, I'm satisfied, but I'm not. I'm so not. I know that I've got all of you, but you obviously haven't got all of me because it doesn't quite look like the Bible looks like yet. 
Encounter is a result of need. Been desperate. You talk to anyone who has had a diagnosis of a serious or a terminal illness. And they will tell you, oh my goodness, my relationship with Jesus, I've heard it so many times. My relationship with God has just come alive. If only I'd lived like this all of my life, I'm telling everyone around me. Because of need. Encounter is a result of desire. Do we desire Him or do we not? I find these are fairly intrusive questions. And you're either thinking or you're turning off because they're two harder questions. Desire. Encounter is a result of expectation. My expectation is that I'm going to encounter the love, the kindness, the mercy, the grace of an amazing God. Absolutely amazing God. Jesus has done his bit and he's saying, come on. Now, maybe, maybe it's partially because churches have focused too much on things other than his presence. And it's cost us an encounter and lack of encounter. Maybe it's that people, maybe you, have been remiss in spending time in his presence. And therefore you'll come to church, the organisation, not the community, wanting the three-step quick fix spirituality, three steps to prosperity, three steps to living a godly life, three steps to peace in your home, three steps to loving Jesus. I've heard so many three steps in my life, I could spend an eternity trying to work out three steps. How about, how about we just come and say, Jesus, I'm hungry. I desire you. I love you. And I want to respond to your invitation in this context within community to simply step into your presence, believing that I will encounter the goodness, the grace, the mercy, the kindness, the love of an amazing God. I tell you what, we encounter Jesus, the three steps will come. But if you put the three steps first, it doesn't really matter because your self-discipline will break down at some point. But if we can put Jesus first, you know, that's what Jesus came to the cross for was intimate relationship with us. He hung on that cross and when he was hanging on the cross dying, it was about encountering people. He died, he was raised again on the third day. So our relationship, our encounter is not with a story, it's with a living God. His name is Jesus. He paid everything so that we can live this vibrant, intimate journey, relationship with Him, so that we can encounter Him day in, day out. It's like encounter should, it should always be special, but it shouldn't be special. It should be our daily lives. This is the one who fuels us. This is the one who fills us. This is the one who teaches us, who guides us, who instructs us, who acknowledges us. The one who forgives us. To go on that journey, we've got to invite him into our world. He's done everything. He's done it all. The cross was all about taking the gap that existed between people and man and closing it. And the book of Romans tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and we believe in our hearts that He was raised from the dead on the third day, 
It says we will be saved. In other words, we will be connected. The relationship will be formed. And that's a relationship not just for this life, but for all eternity. And that is good news. The fact that encounter can be a daily, momentary experience is great news. It means I'm not an orphan. I'm not isolated. I'm not, I've got God. What more can I have? What more can you have?